So to kick the day off, please sit back, relax, enjoy the day. We've got Adrian Byrne, CIO at Southampton's NHS Trust. Um, Adrian's a very well-respected national CIO. He's the, he's the chair of the National CIOs Forum, and he's going to give an open address today about what, what Adrian thinks it actually means. Adrian Byrne. Does that mean I have to stand here with the microphone, or, do, or does it not matter? Well, if you stand there for a minute, we can mic you up. If you, if, would you like to wander around? Well, I'd, I'd, otherwise I'm standing behind a lectern, which is a bit kind of... Stay there. You keep talking. Yeah, OK. So, um, Andy's a great introduction. I, I, very complimentary. Uh, national respect to CIO. Well, I'm the CIO at, um, at U University hand. Hospital yeah. Southampton. Um, for those of you who heard of the Global Exemplar Programme, we are uh, one of those lucky uh, 16 acute organisations that managed to make it onto that programme. Some people would think that's rather unfair, but um, I think it's a great thing. You know, why wouldn't I? So, there you go. Um, Keep talking. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And also, uh, I'm a member of the Interopen Board, um, which is an organisation that I'll talk a little bit about in my presentation. But Interopen is a very uh, positive organisation about the open sharing of data, which... Uh, of course, with Open EHR, we're very, uh, very keen to explore. And occasional sock wearer. Uh, Andy, are you a pink socks owner? I, I, I'm, I'm guessing you are. What you pink socks? <laughs> yeah. So uh, I haven't got them on today, but uh, talk to me in the break if you want to know what that nonsense is all about. So, uh, and uh, at a burn on Twitter, um, if anyone who wants to follow my occasional sort of retweets of interesting technology things or sometimes political things that you could ignore if you like for uh, other nonsense that I come across. Um, so, um, what is an open EHR and what, what isn't it? Um, that's a monolith and um, one of the reasons I chose that as a, a demonstration of what it isn't is because it's uh, 50 years very recently came up since the uh, release of Stanley Kubrick's Arthur C. Clarke's 2001 uh, a Space Odyssey, which some people think is one of the greatest, uh, or the greatest uh, science fiction movie of all time. Sorry. <laughs> um, it's all right, I'll get it. And um, the monoliths were, um, you know, machines that were millennials old. Um, and they did mysterious things. Um, they could really only be brought, brought down by computer viruses. Um, one thing they were also was they were impenetrable, and that was a fairly good metaphor for uh, some of the uh, systems that, that uh, reside in, in the health services worldwide, I think. So, and they're often called monolithic, aren't they? The huge sort of electronic medical records that exist. Um, and we are, you know, trying to break that down with, with the openness of data. Um, I don't know how we got here, but... Marketing's got a lot to do with it, I think. Um, vendors often try and sell us things that, uh, that present themselves as one thing but actually are something else. So the good old snake oil salesmen exist. They even exist in my local bar, actually. I think I have enough of uh, snake oil when I'm, at, when I'm in the office all day without going to my local in the evening to find they're selling it as well. Um, but luckily... Um, the world is kind of falling in line with a lot of our thinking on this, really. Um, we've been working in Southampton for 20 years, really, on uh, open data platforms. Before, it was kind of called open platforms. I'm not sure if anyone's really got an agreed definition. There's, some, there's a list of things that Aperta have released recently. I'll come on to that list in a little while. But we've been working with open data for about 20 years in Southampton. And I, I, I was just thinking about this the other day, and it was almost like when Web 1 existed, we were trying to work in Web 2. And now Web 2 exists, we're trying to work in Web 3. Web 1 being a bunch of web pages where you can look at information, and Web 2 being a more transactional, two-way uh, view of, of doing things, and Web 3 starting to involve 
things like Internet of Things and connecting with, with customers properly with the IoT, um, that world. And we're doing that now in Southampton with uh, our personal health record, where we are uh, you know, one of the successful organisations, one of the few successful secondary care organisations actually that have a relationship with their patient. So we've, we've always had access to all of our data, and that's enabled us to do things, <coughs> sometimes for remarkably little money, actually, um, and, and progress onto things like order communications for laboratory uh, requesting stuff. We did that in the early 2000s. Um, but also, um, recently, a whiteboard project for our wards where we pull information out of the EPR and we've replaced the traditional sort of way, nurses writing up on boards and that kind of thing. Now, we've always felt that was the way to go because uh, we felt it could be achieved. Uh, we've used integration engine technology for a long time. If you know what that is, it's a means of interfacing this data together. Um, but somewhat of a heretic, I think, in terms of people like, uh, like the big analysts, Gartner, over many years, who have said you can only do this um, by uh, implementing monolithic systems, frankly. Um, and then it was last year, I'm not quite sure when, it was about a year ago, the EHR, Open EHR event in Manchester, I forget, was it about a year ago, Andy? Yeah. Uh, Gartner were there. And, um, and they put up a slide really saying that they now uh, think that the NHS IT market is too reliant on closed proprietary systems. And I thought, whoa, that's good, that fits. <laughs> I like this because that's what we've been trying to do for a long time. So, and now we see more people uh, bringing up, of course, uh, the kind of open technologies into, into actual mainstream use. Uh, and it's really good to see what's going on down here in Plymouth. So, you know, thanks, Andy, for inviting me down to give my view on it, really. I, I truly hope it's a success. Um, so... You see these guys' logo all over the place. What is an open platform? And recently, uh, a part of this organisation has, has produced a list of things uh, mm. that define what an open platform should do or should aspire to. Um, and really, you can't argue with much of that. You know, if you, uh, there's there's a, uh, one or two of those books around, I think, so I recommend you have a look at that. I'm not going to go through them all uh, individually. Um, but it's kind of common sense, really, common sense approach to open, open data. Now, I think we've been, um, we've been moving towards this kind of open data, you know, for a very long time. As I said, we've been uh, working like this in Southampton for oh, 20, 20 years. But if you look back um, to the kind of monolith, top left there, I mean, Back in the day, if you were, like, I don't know, sort of around 1960 or something, um, you really had no choice if you were buying an IBM computer. Uh, you bought an IBM computer. Uh, the operating system was proprietary on that computer, and the application software that sat on top of that would only run on that uh, operating system, on that actual uh, chip or piece of tin. Um, and then open systems came along and kind of changed that really. Um, layers of openness um, broken down roughly into applications, transport, internet and network interface. Now, what's that? What you can start to think about then though is the implementation of databases on you know, open Unix platforms and started to separate. So you could buy your computer from one lot of people and your database from someone else. Started the separation <coughs> through the world of the internet web services, and of course, people carrying mobile phones around nowadays with you know, many small apps on them that all interface with open data sources. But now we're kind of seeing this emergence of this kind of microservices um, environment, which is really interesting. Um, I googled microservices for a picture and uh, came up with that kind of made-up fish, and I thought it was quite, it was quite apt. Because Really, an application now, or a function within a large function within something like a hospital, can be made up of many different small services. And we're looking, for example, at um, applications that will do no more than acknowledge uh, a set of lab results. 
So we've got a messaging system in, in our organisation uh, called Medex Note. It's not live yet, actually, but we're, we've got it working. It's like uh, WhatsApp for doctors. Uh, you all know about you know, the, the scandal, if you like, <laughs> about uh, doctors using WhatsApp um, and they sh the fact that they shouldn't, but they do. Um, what I believe is that we, we need to replace that, but we need to replace it with something that's more useful for WhatsApp or they're not going to use it. Mm -hmm. uh, and within the messaging system that we've implemented, um, we have uh, the ability to build this chatbot in chatbot technology. Uh, we can interface those robots back into our um, core hospital systems. And therefore, we're looking at messages that we'll call uh, lab data, into your you know, WhatsApp, and the ability then to send an acknowledgement message and do no more than that, just with that application. So a world where you can use microservices to, to interact with your big data back-end platforms, such as Open EHR. So in future, I think you'll see a lot more sort of small applications that are running services like that using API technologies, application program interface technologies. So that's kind of my journey to where we are and where we've sat, uh, sat on it along the way. Um, the other thing to note about hospitals, I think, is that radiology has been working like this for a long time, actually. Um, <clears throat> I think when we replaced our radiology system, our PAX system, back in 2012, um, we went out also to buy something called Vendor Neutral Archive, uh, VNA. And that really is exactly what it says it is. Um, you can run, in theory, anybody's PAC system on top of your vendor neutral archive archive. Why would you do that? Well, um, the main reason, I think, is to give yourself the ability to move from one uh, PAX vendor to another PAX vendor without having to move all of your data. And that's, that's a big deal, actually. Um, in PAC systems, because the data is quite large, as you can imagine. When we went live with our systems, we were still migrating data 18 months later. So in a, a five-year contract, <laughs> you can see that you've no sooner put your system in than you're having to think about migrate data if you, if you don't um, start to use this kind of technology. Uh, it does other things, like it does life cycle management of data and um, will manage the, the data that you don't want to see very much, if at all, onto cheap, <coughs> slow storage and keep your, you know, the data that's very active and in fast storage and that kind of thing. So a, you know, it makes, it's a business case for it as well. But as I say, this has been, uh, existed in, in, uh, in the PAX world for quite a long time, largely through uh, a standard called DICOM, which is the um, digital imaging uh, communication standard and that allows you to save these objects in the system so that you know, every system can kind of understand it. Now, in actual fact, uh, the open EPR or platform or an open EHR platform should be very similar to that. And that's what I think we're talking about with open EHR. It's an open platform for data where you can talk to that data uh, using various services. Some of those are the uh, open EHR's own query language, of course, if you know about that stuff, but also something called HL7 Fire, uh, which is um, largely supported in this country by a group called InterOpen that I'll come on to. I've mentioned them already. So that's the kind of my vision of how it all works with um, open platforms and how it should work like PACs. And I, I mentioned also that we're a, a sort of a, 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 in the vanguard, if you like, of organisations that are doing things with, with patients online. And um, I talk a lot about this because it's one of the things that, they know that we're, <coughs> we're known for. But I think that the personal health record is exactly, <coughs> or should be, exactly the same. And we've, we've built this in Southampton so that the uh, personal health record sits out in the Azure cloud. Um, and therefore, uh, various application vendors can talk to it. Um, so we talk to it as a as a hospital and as a user, if you like, but the patient also <coughs> uh, talks to it as a user. So this kind of concept of open platform technology is now quite pervasive. It's, um, 
it has taken off, if you like. And we've got different ways of, of getting to uh, where we need to be, really. And uh, I stole this diagram off Ian, and he tells me he's, he stole it off somewhere, somebody else. <laughs> so so I'm, okay to, I'm okay to use it. But it's, uh, this is just kind of, to me, just summed it up in a kind of a really, how do things connect in this world? Um, because in an open EHR world, which we're here today to talk about open EHR, you've got a clinical data repository based on archetypes, which I'm sure someone will talk about later. Um, and, um, and you talk to it using open EHR APIs, which you can then build applications on top of. But actually what we can't get away from is the fact that <coughs> we will still have our local persistent uh, data stores that are associated with uh, the applications you know, that, that are, at the end of the day, still very dominant in the market. You've got, uh, I don't know, a prescribing system. And I know that this hospital in Plymouth is, is going live with the open EHR prescribing system. But across the country, you'll see prescribing systems based on other databases, such as Microsoft SQL Server or uh, InterSystems Cache, etc. So you treat those things as local stores and then build Fire APIs on top of, on top of those to open up those platforms. And then you start to get into an ecosystem where you can actually build um, the applications. And you, you then gain some application portability on top of, on top of the data. Okay. So I can, in theory, you know, I can swap out an application that does a small thing, um, bring in something that I might like better, um, because it's more functional or better user interface or whatever it might be cheaper, um, without having to move all of the data. So the same principle comes through again and again, really. And uh, you know, what, what causes us to change to these things? <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's, uh, that's a little postcard that's on the wall in my office. So I just took a photograph of it and thought, I'll use that. Um, what does cause us to change? Um, Friedman is not my favourite economist. I'm not a, a fan of the economists. I don't know much about economists, but I know Friedman was an economist. He's Thatcher's economist, uh, Thatcher's favourite economist. So he kind of naturally is not my favourite economist. Um, but uh, he said that only a crisis, actual or perceived, uh, produces real change. Um, and that may be true. But of course, if you carry on doing the same thing, you'll always get the same thing. Well, however, that sort of saying goes: do the same thing, you'll always get what you got. And some people have got to drive forward with change. What's to stop us living in that world where it's, you know, nobody gets fired for buying IBM? That kind of the old saying. Nobody gets fired for buying, you know, monolithic US um, EMR vendor. Well, <laughs> what, what makes us change? Sorry. Yeah. So Keith McNeil got fired. <laughs> <laughs> oh, fair dues. <laughs> he seemed to do all right for himself, okay. Keith. Um, so, I mean, certain brave, brave people uh, change, change things, don't they? Um, they see a way, and they think, "Hang on, this is all wrong. Uh, we're going to change it. Uh, we're going to do something different." I like that picture I found on the internet because mostly you see this Tiananmen Square thing. Uh, as, a, as a, uh, a close up on the guy standing in front of the tank. <coughs> well, that's the only picture I've ever seen of the, the guy was actually holding up a, a complete um, line of tanks, which is kind of, I thought I really liked it when I saw it. So that's one of the great things. Twitter is my favourite thing on the internet, by the way. So <laughs> I so love it. And uh, if you follow a few, pi um, few people who uh, you know, post pictures, Every now and then you, you get one come up, you think, oh, I'll use that in a presentation at some time. You stick it in your clip art. That's, that's kind of what I do. Um, but it was brave people. Oh, look, there we go. Andy. <laughs> um, I was watching um, your video um, about the open EHR and what you're trying to do, and I thought, wow, that's, you know, that's really good. Um, so it takes brave people to take a step, you know, and not to just follow the herd, uh, because do what you always did, you know, get what you always got. And some of us are just kind of too busy, aren't we? You know? um, so it's nice that someone can not, not only have the courage of their convictions, um, 
but they can make time to do it as well. And that's a real talent to be able to do that, actually. And carry your board with you when they're saying things like, when are we going to be paperless, Andy? You know, or, you know it's, it's, the, it's 2018. What are you playing around with in that, in that software lab? You know, but make, making time to do it in the, in the right way is a real um, a talent. Now, I mentioned um, open data and the fact that we've been doing this for a long time. Um, and it gives you the ability to do things. I mentioned the acknowledgements application that, that we are building uh, and lab results. I mean, I can show you on my phone, for example, the messaging application that I spoke about, just pulling results out of our EPR into a message. My ambition is to be able to, for a doctor then to be able to say, oh, OK, these don't look right. Involve that person in the conversation. What do you think of these? Um, oh, I think you should go and run another test or do this or that or prescribe this drug or that drug. And then, you know, push that conversation back into the EPR. Those kind of things we want to do with open data. And because you've got access to your data, you can build things. Things that are possibly not a function that exists in, you, in your actual current uh, EMR suite. So that's our ward, uh, whiteboard. Um, it's an interesting project. Every, every project's interesting when you start getting involved with clinical people because you have one idea about what they're doing and how you're going to build it. And you produce a prototype. And then before you know where you are, you've, um, you've got into a whole world of stuff you didn't expect. Um, and the nice thing is that some of those things you didn't expect turn out to be real benefits as well. So um, it's, it's a sort of fantastic environment to work in. Anyone who's been onto a ward ever knows that they, they have you know, these whiteboards and they put magnets on them. Now, because they're putting these magnets on to say that you, know, you need, a, I don't know, a, a, a certain type of nurse, an admiral nurse or something, which is um, a sort of dementia nurse, or um, you need to be turned every four hours and they put a magnet up when you, when you need turning and then take it down again. These are things that are not recorded anywhere in your current um, electronic medical record. Um, and they're not even recorded in the paper record, actually, a lot of it. Um, but when you come to replace that whiteboard, you, you need to record them then here. <laughs> so we start to think, well, how are we going to do that? Um, so we wanted to build, uh, build this so that it was touch screen activated. Uh, I have to say, when we first came up with the idea two or three years ago, we thought, well, that's all very well, but we're not going to be able to afford to put 55-inch touchscreens on every ward. Um, but then, of course, we came into some money, so, so we were able to. And it's been a just fantastically positive experience to, to roll out that project. Um, and we're, you know, there's all kinds of a functionality on it. One of the things I would say, though, is you, you, you don't want to add too much. People st start coming along and saying, well, can we do this? Can we order a set of um, a blood tests from the lab on this thing? Well, yes, you could, but is it the right thing to do? Um, and we didn't want just to have um, the concept of someone sitting there or standing there with a keyboard and mouse, because in these situations, that we do these things called board rounds on our wards. I don't know if the term is familiar to people in the, in the audience, but um, the group on, you know, I don't know how many times a day, three or four times a day, they'll get around the whiteboard and they'll decide what needs to happen with these patients that are on this list. But if one of those people is sitting there with their head down typing, they're out of that, they're effectively out of that conversation. And the, the way that the touch screen works, it actually means that the person manipulating the data is still a part of that conversation. So it, it's not just about fancy technology. Actually, it does change the way that that sort of um, that huddle you know, happens. Um, but that is only possible. That kind of thing is only possible uh, if you have open access to the data. You know, we built this with a single developer. Uh, who, who does it iteratively, the main cost of this to us has been the actual screens themselves. And I think we spent about, I don't know, £250,000 on screens or something, rolling it out. 
very popular project there. And I think that really uh, any hospital uh, now should be looking to have something like this because the data that you can get from it back into the control room starts to release um, release time from the <coughs> bed managers. We've got about 20 bed managers that run around the organisation traditionally and we're now starting to, uh, starting to uh, think about whether we can reduce that number. Um, you don't want to do too much with these things, but just a great example of what you can do. If a patient is on the ward with, uh, and they're a diabetic, and you just touch on their diabetic symbol, bang, you can see their last few HbA1c and blood glucose results. So you're, you're in immediate control in terms of what, what you might need to do uh, with that patient you know, in the next hour or so without needing to go too far. So um, I've talked a little bit. I've mentioned interopen a couple of times. I've got a couple of slides about interopen. I'm sure many people in the room have heard of interopen. Um, this is a uh, Newcastle declaration, though. This, this was a, a declaration that came out of the very first, I believe, Chief Clinical Information Officer's um, summer school, which was held in Newcastle, hence it's called uh, the Newcastle Declaration. I think it was probably held in Newcastle because our friend Joe MacDonald lives there, and, and he sort of uh, insists ad infinitum that just about everything in the world was invented in Newcastle. Um, but, um, for example, electricity. Um, so, um, I mean, this is another common sense thing, really. Uh, we declare that in order to provide safe and effective care, you know, all of the people involved in, in the treatment of a patient should have access to all of the information they need while they're treating the patient. It's bold or obvious, right? Um, so, Interopen is a, is a group uh, that is cross industry, cross sector. Uh, representation, you know, uh, NHS Digital, CIO Network, um, a, a group called Tech UK, British Computer Society, um, Open EHR, um, HL7, uh, there, there's a few more. Have I missed anyone really important? TRSB, I shouldn't have forgot them, should I? <laughs> IHE, absolutely. So, a whole, a whole group of people, and we meet monthly in London to talk about how we can progress the openness of data um, and, as I mentioned, uh, curating and defining the fire profiles that we'll need systems to comply with uh, so that we can uh, make data available to applications. And the biggest you know, headline piece of work there is something called Care Connect, which is about um, c connecting uh, open, open primary care data really, um, so that we can start to uh, improve the data transfer mechanisms between primary and other uh, healthcare settings. And what are we trying to achieve? Well, clearly, we want the person treating the patient next to the bed to have the information they need uh, in the format they need it. We want the patient to have access. We want the clinician to be able to have access from wherever they happen to be sat. And we also want you know, conversations that happen you know, across the wire, uh, to be informed, to be informed by data. And, you know, we are going to achieve that, once again, by opening up data and using standards to do it. And there um, is a curation process for defining these interfaces. <laughs> and lots of people need to be involved in this, unfortunately. It's a bit like the EU, I suppose. Um, everything seems to take much longer and be more complicated than, than you, you would think it is at first sight. But there's a, now a system you know, that is being developed where proposing members can offer up an idea or use case for interfacing, and that will go through a ratification and curation process, and eventually there will be a standard that vendors will comply with to exchange data, and that is the idea. That's what we're all working very hard uh, to achieve. How much time have I got now? So, where am I? On the About six minutes. Yeah, okay. So, I, 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 I mean, I've mentioned already uh, that uh, we're sort of personal health record um, vanguard, if you like. Open APIs uh, are very important to us in that world. Um, so, open platform PHR, front end applications, open APIs. 
And I'll just mention really that we've, we've also branded something called Open PHR you know, for the NHS. Hopefully, hopefully we'll grow that uh, because our ambition is for the sort of PHR world to, to sit there as a, as a vendor neutral source of data for applications to use. Um, and the reason for that is, is that there are various um, I don't know, applications out there that patients can use um, and that there's a real spectrum of use in personal health records. Um, but to, to deliver the ideal personal health record experience, you need to use open platforms uh, and it needs to be, once again, vendor neutral. Uh, a group called CLASS has a view on this. Uh, you can only deliver basic services if you deliver uh, an, an unattached uh, model. But if you, you, if you get into um, a so-called untethered model where the, the personal health record sits within the realm of the patient, you can start to deliver specialised services. And by that, I mean that you can actually start to give patients control of their disease, such as long-term condition. And there's evidence that through using these kind of open technologies now, you can really start to reduce the visits that patients have to make to hospital. Um, so we see a lot of success in that. And when I talk about um, open platforms, I really spend a lot of time really primarily talking about personal health records. Um, Patient-centred is a thing that's used a lot in terms of people's uh, the mantra, if you like. But how often do you really see a truly patient-centred architecture? The answer to that is really never. Um, the only way you see that is, is in a, a world where you can deliver something to them that really is truly there at the centre of it. Various applications uh, can talk then to their record and that they own it. So that's our ambition. And of course, there's a front end. Why wouldn't there be? But it's a separate thing to the back to the back end data store. So, open platforms. Um, where are we? Uh, I think we are at the point where we're kind of launching, really. Um, so escape velocity is required. Um, and uh, I like to think that around here uh, you will be successful. Um, I like to think that all people who are working on open data platform and projects will be successful because that will free us um, from the traditional vendor lock-in that we hear about so much, but it's a very real thing, actually. But I think I'll just finish with um, something that's out of uh, Bob Wachter's book, because we just can't uh, forget that actually systems have to be usable. And um, sometimes we can get a bit carried away with uh, the, the idea of technology, and it has to be this or that technology. And this is an advert from um, an Arizona hospital that Bob likes to quote, where uh, they are advertising for staff on the basis that their hospital did not have any electronic medical records, and they saw that as a positive thing. Uh, and you know, the bottom line is that that is what we are working against, really. Nobody wants to be there. I hope they wouldn't place that advert now. But anyway, thank you for listening. Any immediate questions for AD? We can take a couple of quick questions if anybody's got anything they'd like to ask now. Morning, Ed. Morning. Um, I was just going to ask um, how portable and transportable you think the work is that you're doing in Southampton to anywhere else? Uh, with with regards to all of it, or the personal health record well, bit, or well, I guess you you know we're, you're talking about having an open platform and access to your data, and I completely agree. You have got access to your data. You know that's the mm. that's the gold. You can in control of your own destiny to an extent. But you know, c can that be lifted up and used somewhere else, or is it very Southampton specific? You know, the boards that you use and the processes that it's involved with, because from a 
obviously from a national perspective, the reason that we're interested in what's going on in Plymouth is that it's been done against the backdrop of openly published standards, vendor neutral, technology neutral. Mm. Um, and it should be more portable. I was just interested in how yeah. portable you think what you're doing is, which is great, and it solves your problem, mm. but we've got to solve this problem across the whole of the country. Yeah. So within the GDE programme, um, there is a, a, a parallel piece of work called blueprinting. Um, and obviously we're actively within that because you, know, you have to be. Um, so it's fair to say that some of what we do is portable and some isn't. And, and some of what we have, you know, you wouldn't want it to be portable because it's the old thing where if you wanted to get somewhere, you wouldn't start from here. Some of the things that we have, uh, I wouldn't implement if I was starting now. Some of the things I would. So I think if some of what we do is portable um, so personal health records are portable. We're working with um, already 10 hospitals on that now. So that's, that's used across, across the country. Um, and we're working with Interopen on the, the fire profiles. Um, and that will make uh, open, openness of data and those fire profiles will be hopefully reused. Some of the underlying technology that we have, you know, like our order communications, it will probably only be used locally, but some of the interfacing standards will be used wider. Uh, we, we have a document management system, um, and we are probably going to work with our fast follower, which is Hampshire Hospitals, on, uh, on implementing uh, document management across um, those two hospitals. You know, products is difficult. When you start talking about replicating products, you're then into a world of, well, how are we going to work with this in procurement? So. There's different challenges when you start replicating things around. But the answer to your question basically is some of it is replicable uh, and we try and make everything as standard as, as we can from here forwards. But we are working with a lot of legacy platforms as well. So some of it isn't. Any other quick questions? I'm trying to be multifunctional here. I'm trying to change the, yeah. the PowerPoint slides as well. One final question, and then we'll move on. Uh, Robin Breslin from 4 I, oh. I was interested uh, looking at the how <coughs> a lot of data is surfaced through the, your approach. You've brought a lot of data to, and information to the surface. Have you started yet to measure new things that you weren't able to measure before, or are you a little bit early in the, in the process to do that? I think we have. Um, I couldn't stand here and give you a list, but um, the answer to your question, yes. <laughs> um, so what you find is all of a sudden you have access to uh, the, the ability to build like dashboards onto your hospital you know, that, that you wouldn't have had before. So in a hospital, in a, traditionally, you'll have patients in, in what they call outliers. It's a, it's a funny thing, outlying patients. So it's, it's probably a word that doesn't really exist, but because you can be outlied as a patient. Um, but um, sometimes you'll be in a situation where you've got patients in a level two bed who need a level three bed, and patients in a level three bed who can't move into a level two bed, um, because you've got this log jam situation and you don't have visibility of it. Um, and then patients who are sitting in, in the wrong area. They should be in a, you know, an elderly care area, but they're on a, a medical ward, that kind of thing. Um, and when you have then the ability to analyse the hospital in real time, you can start to... Well, what the data tells you is, is, that, is that you can start to manage the, the organisation in a different way. So we are doing various things, basically. Um, but I think it's fair to say that... When you do a business case for any IT system, uh, you cannot possibly dream of all the benefits that, that will come out of it later. The challenge is to get your business case over the line so that, so that you can then start to do these things. If you try and develop a perfect business case where you're looking for you know, all of your benefits, um, well, you'll be wasting your time, frankly. You know, that's my view, anyway. 
Thanks, Amy. Bye. Bye.